Welcome to Preeminent Test Prep. Today I'll be taking you through the Writing and Language section of SAT Practice Test 10. I'll be giving you my tips, tricks, and advice for the SAT Writing section, as well as answer explanations for the questions and grammar rules to help you through the Writing section of the SAT. Make sure to subscribe for more content, and let's go ahead and get started with Passage 1. So I'm going to read through the passage, and as I get to questions, I will answer them and give tips and tricks along the way. So we have How a Cat in the Hat Changed Children's Education. In a 1954 Life magazine article, author John Hersey expressed concern that children in the United States were disengaged from learning how to read. Among other problems, Hersey noted, the reading material available to grade schoolers had a hard time competing with television, radio, and other media for children's attention. Okay, here, I don't have to change anything, right? We have a list of three. Our last term is other media. We need and before it with that comma there. That comma isn't even underlined, so all we have to consider is the word here, words and, so it follows the grammar rules. We don't want to add anything else because that would just be inefficient and it wouldn't follow grammar rules right we can't disobey the grammar rules all right one solution he proposed was to make children's books more interesting now we're asked the writer wants to include a quotation by Hersey that supports the topic of the passage which choice best supports this goal well we need to know the topic of the passage right well although we kind of can see that the topic of this passage is making children's books more interesting we want to read a little bit more so once we get down to like right here that's when I'll kind of come back to two all right, so we have the story of the cat and hat public. The story of the cat and the hat's publication began when William Spaulding, the director of the education division at the publishing company Hugh and Mifflin. All right, well I see I have this comma here, right, and I have a comma here. This whole part, the director of the education division at the publishing company Hugh and Mifflin, that is a non-essential phrase that's describing who William Spaulding is, right? So what I see is I have this comma. I'm going to erase what I just marked so you can see the grammar markings, right? So what I see is I have this comma right at the end of that non-essential phrase, which tells me I have to have the comma here to completely set off my non-essential phrase. And the way you can tell if, if it is non-essential is if you can take out everything between those commas and the sentence still makes sense, then it's non-essential, which you can do right here. And you can pause and do it by yourself to make sure if you want, but I'm not going to just because I want to move a little bit quicker through this section. All right, so we know our answer then for number three is going to be A, no change, because we already have that comma there which splits up that non-essential phrase. All right, so we've got Reed Hersey's article and had an idea. Spaulding agreed that there was a need for appealing books for beginning readers. Okay, right here, I can pretty much know that I'm asked to combine the sentences, right? Because it's the start of one and the end of the other with a period. So if I'm doing that, what I see is I have an independent clause before. I have, I have Spaulding agreed there was a need for appealing books for beginning readers. That's an independent clause. And then I have, he thought he knew who should write one. That's another independent clause. So since those two ideas are pretty connected, right, they kind of support each other, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a comma, and then I'm going to say, and he thought, right? So my answer there will be A, right? I'm not, I can't use an M dash for two, two uh, independent clauses. Also, I wouldn't want to add namely, right, because that's kind of unnecessary. C, I wouldn't want to use a semicolon with and, right? We could use a semicolon, but then we don't want to use and. So we can get rid of C. And then we have a comma and meanwhile he, we don't have to have meanwhile, right? That's unnecessary and inefficient. We don't want to use that. So our answer for four will be A. Now we can come back to two. Which choice best accomplishes this goal of supporting the topic of the passage? All right, clearly the topic's about getting children more interested in reading through, through different reading works, right? Through illustrated children's books, right? That's what it's looking like it's going to be. All right, so I look at, because we know the cat in the hat is an illustrated children's book. All right, so choice A says, interesting sense an individual's sense of wholeness follows and cannot perceive a sense of accomplishment. That's way off. B, interesting sense learning starts with failure. The first failure is the beginning of education. No, we're not saying education is a failure, so not even close for B. C, interesting because journalism allows its reading, its readers to witness history. We really, that's not even close. We're not talking about journalism. Fiction gives its readers an opportunity to live it. We can get rid of C. Left with D, interesting with drawings like those of the wonderfully imaginative geniuses among children's illustrators. And that's exactly what we're talking about. So we're going to pick D there. We move on. We got he arranged to have dinner with Theodore Geisel, who wrote and illustrated children's books under the name Dr. Seuss and issued him a challenge. Write me a story that first graders can't put down. All right. Which choice best supports the information that follows in the sentence? Having known Spaulding for many years and maintained a professional relationship, Geisel was an experienced writer and illustrator. All right. Well, what we want to do is since we know that we want what is underlined, right, whatever we want to put in there to support what follows, what follows is a statement that says Geisel was an experienced writer and illustrator, so we want what's underlined to show that he's experienced, right? So if I look at my choices, A is out because that doesn't talk about that. B, acquired a reputation for perfectionism and for setting high standards for his work. 
that still doesn't really give us the idea of his experience, right? C, been, been interested in politics before breaking into the genre of children's literature. That's background, but not the background we're looking for. We want experienced writer and illustrator. And D, published nine children's books and having received three nominations for the prestigious Call, Call the Cop Medal, right? That's showing how he's an experienced writer and illustrator. All right, now we have this project presented him with a new obstacle, right? With an obstacle. And why did I go ahead and skip however? Well, I skipped it because it's the first word in a sentence with a comma after it, which is telling me it's a transition word. When I see a transi transition word, I go ahead and read the rest of the sentence and then come back. What this is showing me is I'm going to use however, right? It's going to be no change, and here's why. Because this new project presented him with an obstacle, that's telling me that there's a shift, right? There's a contrast. He's experienced, but however, my contrast word, this new project presented an obstacle, right? We're not going to use for example, furthermore, or at any rate. Our answer will be A. All right, we'll go ahead and make sure that we don't have anything left to answer up here, and we do not, so we go ahead and keep moving. All right, question seven. We're going to work our way down, right? So we're going to go ahead and go where we left off. Spalding told Geisel to write his entire book using restricted vocabulary for an elementary list of 348 words. Geisel started two stories, only to abandon them when he found that he needed to use words that were not on the list. On the verge of giving up, Geisel's story, and I can go ahead and stop there. I know what change I have to make off the bat. When I read on the verge of giving up, that is an introductory modifying clause, right? It's modifying whatever is coming after it. But what is it, like what, I'll read it, on the verge of giving up, right? Who? Who is on the verge of giving up? Geisel, not Geisel's story, right? It has to be Geisel right here. It can't be anything else. It has to be only Geisel, not Geisel's story. My only answer choice with Geisel is C, so it has to be C. I don't even have to read the rest. All right, his main character established, Geisel commenced the difficult task of writing a book with a limited vocabulary. Now we have eight. At the end of a duration, nine months long, that's inefficient. If we say nine months long, we shouldn't have to say end of a duration, right? Because we could just say after nine months, right? Which nine months later, there it is, right? That's efficient. We don't want to use B after 36 weeks or nine months had passed because that's also inefficient. And then C, after a length of nine months had elapsed, once again, that's inefficient, right? We want to be efficient. The efficient choice here is D, nine months later. Nine months later, the cat in the hat was complete. All right, the book was a hit. Children were entertained by its plot about the antics of a mischievous cat. And, okay, we're not going to use is here, right? Because we want to use parallelism. So we said children were entertained by its plot about the antics of a mischievous cat and captivated, right? We're going to want to use and captivated right there. So what we're going to do is we're going to pick delete the underlined portion. Because we already used our, we have were, right? They were entertained. We want to keep that parallelism then and captivated. They were entertained and captivated. Saying was, has been, or is is unnecessary, and it's grammatically incorrect. All right, by its eye-catching illustrations and memorable rhymes and ry rhythms and rhymes, its sales inspired another publishing company, Random House, to establish a series for early readers called Beginner Books, which featured prominent works by Geisel and other writers, and other publishers quickly followed suit. In the years that followed, all right, in the years that followed, that is not an independent clause, right? That's not an independent clause. It's dependent. When we have a dependent clause start our sentence, we have to end that dependent clause with a comma. So we want in the years that followed, comma. Where do we have in the years that followed, comma? We have that in answer choice C right there, right? We're not going to use that semicolon. If we're going to use a semicolon, we have to have an independent clause before it, and we do not. We can get rid of B. D, we don't want to have our dependent clause come before an M dash. We have to have an independent clause, right? So we can get rid of D. A, we can get rid of because it's not an independent clause. We got C is the only one left, and C is grammatically correct. All right. But perhaps the best proof of the Cat in the Hat's success is not its influence on other books, but its writer wants a conclusion restating the main theme. Main theme was that it helped children read, right? Which choice best accomplishes this goal? A does not. B, impressive worldwide sales. We're not concerned about sales. C, enduring ability to delight children and engage them in learning how to read. Absolutely, right? That is our answer. D, important role in the history of illustration. We don't really touch on that. All right, passage two. Questions 12 to 22 are based on that. Keep student volunteering voluntary. A growing number of public schools in the United States require students to complete community service hours to graduate. Such volunteering, be it helping at a local animal shelter. Okay, here's what I see right off the bat as I read this. I see I have a list of three things, right? I have helping at a local animal shelter, picking up litter, and working at a health care facility. Now, why did I say picking up litter right here instead of when they pick up litter? Well, I had to maintain parallelism, right? I said helping at a local animal shelter and working at a healthcare facility. So what I'm paying attention to here is I have helping and working, which means I have to have picking to make up that, to keep consistent with that parallelism, right? So I have to have answer choice D as my answer. All right, 
has obvious benefits for the community it serves and teaches students important life skills, but critics say that making volunteerism compulsory misses the point of the act. Now I'm asked, the writer wants a transition from the previous paragraph that highlights the criticism of compulsory, compulsory volunteering mentioned in the previous paragraph. Which choice best accomplishes this goal? Well, we have by its very definition, volunteer work is done willingly, right? What that's saying then is that, hey, making people volunteer isn't really making a volunteer because it's supposed to be voluntary, right? You're supposed to be doing it without being required to. So it's showing that it's that there's good criticism or there is criticism of that compulsory volunteering, right? So our answer there is going to be A, whatever the work may be, that doesn't highlight that criticism. Neither does for many students and neither does fortunately for communities in need. All right, by requiring students to do community service in order to graduate, school officials are taking away students' choice to give up their time for nonprofit activities. Here's what jumps out to me right away. When I read school officials here, there's nothing that it possesses. So I can't have that apostrophe. That apostrophe can only be used in this case if it's possessing something, right? And it doesn't, right? So I can't use that. So I can get rid of choice A because we have to make a change. All right, so I have officials. They're all the same, are taking away. And now the only difference between these three choices is in students, right? Students choice to give up their time. Well, students, students do own their choice to give up time, right? That is possessive. So anything without apostrophe, so B, I can get rid of. Now, what do we know about the students in number? There are plural students, right? Plural students. When we have plural students, we have to place that apostrophe after that S, right? So our answer has to be D. If we had one student, then it would be answer choice C, but we have multiple. We're talking about multiple students in a school. So our answer is going to be D for 14. All right, making volunteerism less meaningful and pleasurable according to a psychological concept called the reactance theory. The loss of freedom in choosing the activity can cause a negative reaction. For instance, instead of focusing on the good they are doing, students may become resentful of the demands that compulsory volunteering places on their schedules. Proponents of compulsory volunteering who are in favor of it, okay, that is redundant, okay? We said proponents of compulsory volunteering. We don't have to say who are in favor of it because that's redundant and repetitive, which are two things we do not want to be on the SAT writing section. Right? So I can get rid of A. I can also get rid of B because it says advocating it, but I already have proponents of, meaning that they are advocating it. Once again, that would be redundant. All right, choice D and its advocates, once again, redundant. So my answer is going to be C, volunteering. All right, point out that it allows young people to garner the benefits that volunteering offers. Students who volunteer report increased self-esteem, better relationship building skills, and what? Well, we have to provide a supporting example most similar to the ones in the sentence. All right, all of these things are showing the things that help these people who are volunteering, right? The positive effects from it. So we want to pick a choice that does that, right? So we have increasingly busy schedules. That is not a positive effect, or at least not as good of a positive effect. Some people would consider it, some wouldn't. So we're going to get rid of that because there's going to be a better answer here. B, a closer connection with their community. Yes, that's a positive effect. C, less time engaging in social activities. No, that's negative effect. D, little increase in academic achievement. Also negative effect, or I guess not super negative, but B's B is the only big positive effect, right? So B is our answer for 16. Some studies have also found that students who do community service are more likely to volunteer as adults and thus affect right here. When I see effect, I'm usually thinking off the bat that it's asking about the different types of effect, right? So you have effect, which is a noun, and you have affect, which is a verb, right? So affect is the verb here, right? These students are going to affect a society. They're going to affect a society with an A, right? That's their verb, right? We want to use the verb there so we can get rid of A, right? We can get rid of C. Now it's students, right? If we look up, we've got students as our subject, right? Since we have that plural subject, we also have to have the plural form of the verb, which is affect, not affects. Affects would be if we had a singular subject. Our answer there has to be B for question 17. All right, now we move on to question 18. However, most research looks at students who volunteer in general, not making a distinction between students who are required to volunteer by their schools and those who volunteer willingly. One recent study by Sarah E. Helms, assistant professor of economics at Samford University in Birmingham, Alabama, did focus on specifically on mandatory volunteering, right? That is going to be our answer. We're not going to change that because coercive, forcible, and imperative are all not great word choices, right? The volunteering is required. What means required? Mandatory means required. Coercive would be if someone was manipulating them. Forceful would be if they were physically being forced to do it. And D would be imperative, and that's just not really close to fitting here. All right, and now we have she found that students who are required to volunteer rush to complete their service hours in early high school. And then we have, okay, so we're looking at punctuation between these two independent clauses. How do I know it's an independent clause? Because each one has a subject and verb from this comma, right? We have 
they did significantly less regular volunteer work in 12th grade. And then before it, I have, she found that students who are required to volunteer rush to complete their service hours in early high school. That means I can't have choice A because I have two independent clauses. If I use a comma, that's a comma splice, unless I had a fanboy after that comma. And now I have B, which has that semicolon, which connects my two independent clauses. But then I have a comma after they then. They then does not need a comma after this. So I can get rid of B. And then in C, we have they with a comma after it. We don't need that comma after they. We can get rid of C. We're left with D as our answer. We use that semicolon to split them, and we have nothing, no unnecessary commas in it, right? So answer D is going to be 19. All right, so we have, we've got, she found that students who were required to volunteer rushed to complete their service hours in early high school. They then did significantly less regular volunteer work in 12th grade than who? The stu then did students who were not required to volunteer. Now, why didn't I pick compared with students, right? You would think that's efficient. But here's the problem with compared with students. The problem is that I have parallelism issues, right? Because if I look up here, I have the students who were required to volunteer. Now, I want to compare that to the students who were not required to volunteer, right? So I want to keep that who were. So that's why I did not pick answer. Oh, I'm sorry. I just got rid of B, right? Our answer for 20 is B, right? That is why I had to get rid of answer choice D. Now we can go ahead and get rid of the other ones, right? Because they just don't make sense. All right. Now we can go ahead and I'll, I'll go ahead and show you why actually real quick. Then the service hours of those not required to volunteer, right? That is inefficient. We can get rid of A and then C, then hours worked by students not required to volunteer. Once again, both of those don't maintain that comparative structure, that parallelism. So we can just get rid of them. All right. Now we got question 21. Instead of requiring students to volunteer schools and we're asked which choice sets up the point made in the next sentence, we need to know our next sentence then. So we read it. Many studies show that when schools simply tell students about opportunities for community service and connect them with organizations that need help, more students volunteer of their own free will. All right, so we're looking for a choice or an answer choice setting up that. We have instead of requiring students to volunteer schools, we're looking for a statement that says should allow them to do it freely, right? Should allow students to spend their time participating in athletics and other extracurricular activities? No. Should focus on offering arrangements that make volunteering an easy and attractive choice? Absolutely, right? Because that still leaves the free will up to them, which is what that next sentence is supporting. So that, that should be our answer right there. So our answer is going to be C for 21. D, are advised to recognize the limits of their ability? No, right? We don't want students thinking that they have limited abilities. That's not what this is arguing about. All right, we can go ahead and get rid of A. Not all students are equally well suited. That's not really relevant here. All right, now we can go ahead and go to 22. The writer wants a conclusion that states the main claim, which is the best choice for this goal. All right, we have is imperative that, well, what's our main claim? First of all, we can go and get that. The main claim is that schools shouldn't keep requiring mandatory voluntary service, right? They want it to be free, right? So we go ahead and look at our answer choices. It is imperative schools do their part to find volunteers to the many worthwhile organizations. No, schools that do this will produce more engaged, enthusiastic volunteers than those that require volunteer work. Yes, right? Our argument is that they should allow free, free will, right? Students being able to volunteer, which in this preceding sentence, it says schools simply tell students about organization community service and connect them with organizations they need. More students will volunteer on their own free will. And schools that do that produce more engaged, enthusiastic volunteers than those requiring volunteer work. That is our main claim throughout our whole passage, right? All right, questions 23 to 33 are based on passage 3, so we'll go ahead and get into that. Marsupials, mammals that carry their young in a pouch, are a curiosity among biologists because they lack a corpus callosum. The collection of nerve fibers connecting the two hemispheres of the brain. In most other mammals, the left hemisphere of the brain controls the right side of the body and the right hemisphere controls the left. And the corpus callosum allows communication between the hemispheres. Scientists, and this is going to be, have long believed, and here's why. We have gone through all of this paragraph in present tense, and the only choice in present perfect tense, which is what we need here, is going to be answer choice C, right? The scientists have long believed this structure enables, right there, enables. That's another indicator, present tense. So we're going to answer C because that's our only choice that is in that present perfect tense that we need. So our answer is C for 23. All right, by sequestering skilled movement through a single hemisphere without sacrificing coordination between both sides of the body, this, sequestr this sequestration would explain handedness, the tendency to consistently prefer one hand over the other in humans. All right, so I look at my answer choices for 24. One hand over the other sounds perfectly fine, so I'm going to put a check mark next to A. As long as there's no better, better answers, A will be my answer. I look at B, we have in favor of the use of one hand, in favor of the use of one hand over the other, but we already said consistently prefer. So if we say favor the use of, we're repeating ourselves and we're redundant. We don't want to be redundant or repeat ourselves, so we can get rid of B. 
Now, if we look at question or answer choice C, we have one hand over the other that could be chosen. Well, when we say over the other and that could be chosen, we're just repeating ourselves twice there and we're being redundant, so we can get rid of C. We look at D, one hand on a regular basis, but we already said consistently prefer, so that would also be redundant. So our answer is going to be A because it is not redundant or repetitive. All right, 25. However, a recent finding of handedness in marsupials suggests that a trait other than the presence of a corpus callosum, and then we have, we'll have to solve for 26 in a minute, but 25, as I read through it, nothing glaringly obvious. I look at B through D. All of them have unnecessary punctuation. We don't need a comma. We don't need a semicolon or a colon right there. We just read straight through, right? Suggests that a trait other than the presence of corpus callosum, there's no reason we would need any punctuation there. That's just throwing you off, okay? And that, that may happen on a test or on a practice test. If, if there is no need for punctuation, don't think that you have to have one, okay? If it clearly doesn't need it, just go ahead and hit no change, right? All right, so now we've got other than the presence of a corpus callosum correlates with, right? We would never say correlates from. That's not idiomatic. If you don't know what idiomatic means, it just means it doesn't, it's not what we say in English, right? It's not what we would normally say. Same with links on, also not idiomatic. And same with links as, right? We're correlating two things with each other. They're correlated with each other. So our answer there is going to be B. Correlated with handedness, bipedalism. All right. Researchers, make sure we answered all those on that page. And we did. All right. Researchers at St. Petersburg State University and the University of Tasmania observed marsupials walking on either two legs, bipeds, or four legs, quadrupeds, and performing tasks such as bringing food to their mouth. The scientists employed a mean handedness index. Which choice accurately represent information in the graph? Well, I'm looking at just what I have, right? And it says negative scores indicate a left forelimb preference, so I'm kind of looking at which one indicates right versus left. I see my negative values are the ones that are indicating right, and my positive are indicating left. So I need that as my answer choice. I see I have positive scores indicate a left forelimb preference, and negative scores indicate a right forelimb pre preference as answer choice D for question 27. So that right there is going to be my answer. All right. Now we got, well, eating the eastern gray kangaroo, redneck kangaroo, red kangaroo, and brush-tailed batong. Well, what's wrong with this? We have a list of four, okay? We have eastern gray kangaroo, redneck wallaby, red kangaroo, and brush-tailed batong. We need that comma, then, to come after kangaroo and not after and. So I look at my answer choices, and that's going to be answer choice B. So B will be my answer, right? In that list, we have a comma before our last terms, and we have and after that comma. So our answer is going to be B. All right. All bipedal, all bipedal marsupials preferred using their left forelimb as revealed by, we have our answer choices, we're asked for what accurately reflects the data in the graph. Well, what accurately reflects it? Well, they're all between 0 0.6 and 0 0.4, which is answer choice C, positive mean handedness index values between 0 0.4 and 0 0.6. So my answer for 29 then has to be C. These results suggest handedness among these animals. All right. Question 30, I'm asked which choice provides the best transition from the previous paragraph. Well, I need to know what my next sentence is going to say then in this paragraph to transition, right? So I have quadrupedal, marsu quadru quadrupedal marsupials in the study did not show a strong preference for the use of one forelimb. All right, well, those bipedal marsupials did, right? So this is going to be in contrast, right? Because those are two differing things. So they're going to contrast each other. So we're going to do in contrast to their bipedal counterparts, the quadrupedal marsupials did not show a strong preference for the use of one forelimb. For instance, gray, short-tailed opossums and sugar gliders were assigned mean handedness values very close to zero. They used their right and left forelimbs nearly equally. In effect, the study proved no evidence of handedness among quadrupedal marsupials. All right, 31. Which choice presents a main claim of the passage? Well, what is the main claim of the passage, right? The main claim of this passage is it's talking about handedness in marsupials, right? So we have Kangaroos, though, still do not exhibit handedness to the extent humans do. We don't want to answer that. If we look at choice B, we have for the marsupials in the study, then handedness seems to be associated with bipedalism. And that is a fact, right? If we think about it, in that study and in that data table, or the graph, the bar graph, right, it said that for the bipedal marsupials, there was a strong correlation with that left handedness, right? Having that one handedness. And that seemed to be associated with bipedalism because none of the quadrupedal marsupials had it, right? So our answer there is going to be B. All right. As the researchers noted, the quadrupeds typically live in trees and employ all four limbs in climbing. The bipeds, on the other hand, are far less arboreal, leaving their four limbs relatively free for tasks in which, right? That's going to be the standard, standard English convention, the idiomatic thing to say here, right? We wouldn't say tasks in what 
or whose or whom, right? It's a task, so it can't be a person that gets rid of whom, right? It's not it's not a person's, right, whose. We can't use that. It's not what, it's in which, right? That's the idiomatic thing to say. That's what standard English conventions will tell us we have to say. All right, so we can move on. Why the majority of marsupials studied preferred their left forelimbs while the majority of humans prefer their right remains a mystery. However, and now we're told to conclude the passage by recalling a topic from the first paragraph that requires additional research, which choice best accomplishes this goal? So we could go back to the first paragraph if we wanted to, right? We can just take a quick look at what it talked about. So we do that, we see that the first paragraph talking about how there is two hemispheres in the brain, right? In mammals, in most other mammals, left hemisphere controls right side, right side controls left, and there's communication between the two with the corpus callosum, right? But scientists are saying that a recent finding in marsupials suggests that a trait, or yeah, suggests that a trait other than the presence of corpus callosum links handedness or correlates with handedness, right? So we're really talking about the right and left sides of the brain here. So we go down, we got question 33. We have A, as does the me mechanism by which in the absence of a corpus callosum, the hemisphere of the marsupial brain communicate. Yes, right? That's what the scientists don't know. So that works perfectly because we're asked for a topic that requires additional research and they still don't know on that, right? So they need that additional research. It's in the first paragraph. That's a perfect way to end, right? So we can go ahead and get rid of B, C, and D, and we can move on. To An employee benefit that benefits employers. All right, well, I see this one here, which means I'm going to go find what I have to insert or take out or what paragraph order has to go. I'm going to find the question that relates that, and I'm going to take a look at that so I can try and place it as I go if I find the right spot for it. That way I don't have to reread at the end. All right, so the writer wants to insert the following sentence. To make the passage most logical, the sentence should be placed immediately after the last sentence in which paragraph? All right, so I have still sent securing an excellent workforce is crucial to a business's success. Well, just off the bat, what I see is I have still, which kind of in indicates a contrast. So I'll be looking for something that's contrasting to how securing an excellent workforce is crucial to a business's success. Employers should give serious thought to investing in reimbursement programs. All right, so I'm looking for a contrast to investing in reimbursement programs. So probably something that says, hey, maybe don't invest in a reimbursement program to make it overly simple, right? That would be a good way to contrast. So I know that's kind of oversimplified, but it really kind of is just, that's just kind of what I'm looking for on that one. All right, so I can go ahead and place that as I go if I find the right opening. So I'll go ahead and go back now and I'll start from my beginning. All right. According to a 2014 report for the Society of Human Resource Management, 54% of surveyed companies provide tuition assistance to employees pursuing an undergraduate degree and 50% do so for employees working toward a graduate degree. All right, now I see I have a comma, right? And I have this sort of transition phrase here. So I'm just looking for a great transition. I need to know my sentence then. So I read more companies should consider helping employees pay for education because doing so all right, so we're making our claim more companies should consider helping employees pay for education, but we just said 50% already do so. So what we're looking for is we're saying, although these levels are impressive, even more should be done, right? So our answer there is going to be C. All right, 35, which choice most effectively establishes the main idea of the passage? I don't know the main idea. Well, I guess I do because we kind of just got the claim, right? The claim was just that more companies should consider help helping employees pay for education, right? But now as I look at what's underlined, I see because doing so helps increase customer satisfaction, solve the problem of rising tuition costs, strengthen the U.S. economy, or attract and retain employees. We haven't discussed those yet, right? We haven't discussed that part of the main idea. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to wait and hold off on 35. So we'll have to come back to that and improve the quality of the company's business. All right, tuition reimbursement programs signal that employers offer their workers opportunities. All right, well, workers doesn't own the opportunities, so we can go ahead and get rid of A and D right? And opportunities doesn't own anything either. So we don't need any possessive apostrophes, right? We'll just have C, workers' opportunities. All right. For personal and professional development, and the reason why there's no possessive, right, is because they're offering their workers opportunities. It's not the workers' opportunities that they own. They're getting offered them by their employer, just to clarify. All right. According to Professor of Management Peter Capelli, such opportunities are appealing to highly motivated and disciplined individuals and may attract applicants with these desirable qualities. Many in the business community concur, explaining his company's decision to expand its tuition assistance program. John Fox, and then I have my non-essential phrase here, the director of dealing dealer training at Fiat Chrysler Automobiles in the United States. So I can pretty much ignore that for the purposes of grammar. I have John Fox, 
who's stressed? I wouldn't say John Fox, who's stressed. Would I say John Fox stressed? Yes, I would say John Fox stressed. This provides a simple predicate that makes the sentence grammatically correct, right? I can't use stressing or and he stressed because that would make it not grammatically correct, right? If we had John Fox stressing the importance, that would not be grammatically correct. What if it was John Fox and he stressed? Well, then we're just getting into the inefficient territory. We don't want to say John Fox and he stressed. We would say John Fox stressed the importance of drawing skilled employees to Fiat Chrysler's dealerships. All right, so now what are we talking about? We're talking about employee retention, right? And attracting good employees. So we can go back up and answer choice D for 35. Attract and retain employees is the main idea of the passage. All right, now I'm gonna move down. We've answered 36 and 37. This is a benefit that can surely bring talent to our top dealers. We still haven't placed that sentence that we have at the end. So we have paying for tuition also helps businesses retain employees. I see retain employees here and retaining employees here. I know I can get rid of one of them, right? So we can go ahead and have paying for tuition also helps businesses retain employees, comma, which is important not only, right? Now we're going to explain, which is important not only because it ensures a skilled and experienced workforce, but also it mitigates the considerable cost of finding, hiring, and training new workers, right? So that'll be our answer there. We wouldn't want to say paying for tuition also helps businesses retain employees and then say that is important not only. We can say which, right? That's going to be much more efficient. So our answer for 38 is going to be C, right? We can go ahead and get rid of B. We can get rid of A. All right. And that's just another thing you should look out for. If you see two words, right, end of one sentence, beginning of the other, look to put a comma in and use who, which, where, when, something like that, right? Because that's just really the kind of a good trick to use. All right, and now we've got 39. Employees whose tuition is often, who is reimbursed often stay, stay with their employer even after they complete their degrees, right? And then it says, because their qualifications give them opportunities for advancement within the company, that's a dependent clause. It can't stand on its own, therefore it can't be its own sentence. So we're going to remove this period and just keep going with because, right? So we're just going to have C degrees because. All right, moving on. The career of Valerie Lincoln, an employee at the aerospace company United Technologies, UTC. All right, well, here's the thing. I need that comma after there. You know why? Because we have the career of Valerie Lincoln, and then we're using this non-essential phrase, an employee at the aerospace company, UTC. So we need that UTC in parentheses followed by that comma to complete my non-essential phrase. All right. As a significant success story for her company's tuition reimbursement program. In the eight years at UTC, Lincoln earned associate and bachelor's degrees in business and advanced from an administrative assistant position to an accounting associate position. This allowed UTC to retain an employee with deep knowledge of her industry, all right, it's going to be deep knowledge of her industry, not hidden and not large or spacious knowledge, right? It's deep knowledge, meaning she has lots of knowledge of her, of her industry. Once again, we still have not placed that sentence. So I'm checking at the end to make sure it fits here, which it probably will because it didn't fit anywhere else, right? Tuition reimbursement can be expensive and many companies would find impract impractical to pay for multiple degrees for all employees. Businesses have succeeded in minimizing and keeping down costs. That's repetitive and redundant. We only need one of those, right? So we can get rid of no change. We got minimizing costs associated with employees' coursework. That's too long, right? Because we have business has, have succeeded in keeping down costs. This is the efficient choice, no repetitiveness and no redundance, right? We already said it's with employees' coursework above, right? Tuition reimbursement, right? Find it practical to play for all degrees of employees. We already know that we're talking about coursework. So we can get rid of that. Being effective at keeping down costs, that is repetitive and it's inefficient in word choice. So our answer is going to be D for 42. All right, we've got the relevance of employees' coursework. Yeah, see, that's right here. So that's why we had to get rid of that other one. By offering fixed amounts of reimbursement each year and stipulating which subjects workers can study. Even with these methods, tuition reimbursement may not be appropriate in all cases, especially if classes are likely to divert employees' time and energy away from their jobs. Yes, right? Especially if classes are to divert. We're not going to say diverted, right? Because it's not past tense. We need that that to divert, right? That's idiomatic, right? It is what we would naturally say in English language, not in diverting and not diversions for. The idiomatic expression here is going to be to divert. All right, now we've got question 44, and that does fit here because we say it may not be appropriate in all cases. Still, since an excellent workforce is crucial to a business, employers should give serious thought to investing in reimbursement programs, which means our answer will be D, and we'll place this after paragraph four. Thank you for watching Preeminent Test Prep. Make sure to subscribe, like, and share as we will be releasing more videos to help you prepare for the SAT.